part one of this discussion on spiritually unequal marriage. Specifically, you have one spouse, a believer in Jesus Christ, and the other one is not. We discussed a few things to keep in mind as you live in this often difficult marital situation. And you can see that link in the description below. But in summary, those points are you can rest knowing that you are exactly where God wants you, along with excellent opportunities to grow in your faith. Also, that you should not allow your spouse to stunt or dampen your growing faith. And you should zero in on the common ground, the things that you love to do together, the things that you love about each other, to keep the relationship healthy and maturing. So today, I want to go a step further and clarify two very important phrases. The first being, the unbelieving spouse is willing to live with the believer. And the second phrase is the correct use of unequally yoked. Welcome to Morning Tea. If your unbelieving spouse wants to live with you, that says a great deal. He or she is willing to accept the change in the marriage. They didn't sign up for this when they entered into a covenant with you, but all around, the changes are good. They're mature enough to observe that your increasing faith is making you more loving, more forgiving, more open-hearted, more gracious, kinder. All of these things simply add up to a better marriage partner. So for many, this kind of weird religious shift as they might see it, it's okay, it works in their favor. And for many couples, the marriage relationship even thrives as the believing spouse learns how to let go of the outcome they want. They want their spouse to experience God's love and have the gift of eternal life. It's so common initially for spouses to try and convert and convince, which is absolutely not what God wants you to do and will get you nowhere. You have to remember they are spiritually blind and deaf. So... Don't try doing the work of the Holy Spirit. And also remember that the unbelieving spouse is experiencing, unbeknownst to them, the effect of the sanctification that God has extended to the union, along with your entire family. But it's really important to note the qualification to willing to live. Um, that is, that God calls us to live in peace. So when the words are spoken, I'll stay, I'll live with you in this marriage, it might not translate to the kind of living that results in peace. Peace is the proof. Now, if there is constant bickering, undermining, arguments going on all the time, abusive behavior, this is not living in peace. And it could signal that the unbelieving spouse really doesn't want to live with you, but rather they simply won't leave. Um, perhaps they fear suffering through a divorce, or they're just plain obstinate in nature. Whatever their reasons are, they're stubbornly refusing to leave is not willing to live. So, if every opportunity has been made available to resolve the problems, such as renegotiating the terms of the marriage, perhaps um, bending as far as you can reasonably go, going through counseling, going through therapy, and they display no concerted effort whatsoever or any willingness to pursue and maintain peace in the home, the unbelieving spouse is clearly demonstrating that the terms of the saved, unsaved situation have not been met. Willing to live means they must be favorable to the believer's way of life, which means they must desire a godly style of life. If not, then you need to prayerfully consider God's will in that we should live in peace, you should seek counsel, you should um, be talking to spiritual leaders and mentors. I mean, it's even the opinion of some who have gone further to say that if the unbelieving spouse has shown he is not willing to live and there is no peace in the house, then the believer must divorce and God does permit divorce. So I will add here that regarding divorce, um, I recently started using the term holy matrimony since the word marriage in our culture has come to include all kinds of depraved situation and holy matrimony at least is rooted in the religious recognition uh, of God and his creative order for lifelong joining of one man and one woman. Although I use the term holy matrimony, it's not in the sense of a sacrament. It is a covenant, it's a contract. It has terms and it has an exit if terms are broken or not meant. We can see one example of this in Israel where um, mass divorce was forced upon the Israelites who married foreigners. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, you have been unfaithful, you have married foreign women, adding to Israel's guilt. Now, honor the Lord your God of your ancestors and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples around you and from your foreign wives. So the idea that once you're married, it's for life no matter what is unbiblical, particularly in these situations where there is a spiritual mismatch of a believer and an unbeliever. As for the phrase unequally yoked, this is commonly used to describe a marriage between an unbeliever and a believer. And we see this in 2 Corinthians in the context of Paul and the believers that he was serving. He says, we are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. And he goes on immediately to command them not to be yoked with unbelievers in this way. 
the relationships are defiled and there can be absolutely no yoking of God and Satan is how he describes it. And further, he commands them to come out from them. They must leave those relationships. So if he intended to include marriage in this group, this would stand in a contradiction to his earlier instruction for believing spouses to remain in the marriage with the unbeliever if they are willing to live with them. Well, why is this? Because marriage is not a yoking in that sense of idolatry where yoking resembles two different beasts, a complete mismatch that can no way possibly work. Marriage is two becoming one, and it's a union very, very different from any other sort of relationship. All marriages have differences, big ones. You've got two people coming from different families with unrelated histories, even with different cultural backgrounds, and they're joining together. And not to even mention basic things like men and women are naturally different in size and strength and shape, and um, they each have different knowledge and intellect and different stages in their faith journey and their understanding about spiritual matters. Each bring their differences, their strengths, and their weaknesses to the marriage, and they merge into a brand new unit, one flesh. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. One single creature pulling the plow. And in these marriages, there is great hope. Who else in the life of the unbelieving spouse is demonstrating God's love? There may not be many, if any. And your influence, the Holy Spirit in you, daily in the home, as salt and light, bearing constant witness to the truth, without a word... With all of that, it's quite possible they will be saved by the love you demonstrate. So don't lose heart. Thank you so much for being here. Every week we put out new content to inspire you on your journey. So don't go without subscribing. And remember to look for the blessings. They are all around you. Bye-bye.